So this is the time, as obviously we understand some people are having to leave because we've been blessed with pastors driving four, eight hours to join us. Tomorrow is a day that many people have some activities, some responsibilities with their local fellowship. Uh, Pastor John's already left. Pastor Chuck and Keenan are leaving now. I believe if you want to say something to him, you might have to catch him as he's running out of the door after he's done. Um, and so... The, uh, what's, what's, what's wonderful about this is I actually don't know Eric very well. <laughs> I, uh, I saw a video of him preaching in Portland and just having such incredibly beautiful interactions with some, I don't know who they were, but some groups that weren't very necessarily happy with him initially. And I saw the, the spirit and the peace of the Lord come on the crowd. And that's something that, we're, that I've really come to appreciate. I've come to appreciate the gospel of God being proclaimed with power. And when you see people doing their best to be at peace while you're just addressing the serious things of the soul, uh, that's, that's been incredibly beautiful. I want to make sure that we're saying, you know, just keep in mind, be praying for the, the pastors that are leaving. Be praying for the folks that are driving away. Um, reminder... That uh, when we're all done today, we will be doing uh, some fellowship, some Q and A, some food will be provided here for everybody. Um, let me pray real quick for you. Come on up. Let me pray for you, and then and then we'll get going. Uh, Heavenly Father, we come before you once again that you would give us a spirit of humility, that we would be listening with eyes see and ears to hear that your word, that your faithfulness that Christ is crucified will be exalted in our midst now. Father, bless our brother and may you be glorified in all that we say and do. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Well, it is a blessing for sure to be asked to come here. It's kind of a... Mason has asked me, well, first off, he was uh, kind of last minute, hey, do you mind if we change places and now I'm seeing why because uh yeah following Chuck Pastor Chuck that's thank you uh, but uh but no it is a blessing I, I'm I love Mason and it's such a blessing with just everybody here um the encouragement not just those up here speaking but just everybody we get to fellowship with and labor with on the ground um and I think he you know Mason has asked me to talk about going full time. So how do how do how do, we, how do we do that? How do we how do we go and follow Christ like like Pastor Chuck has asked us to do? And so one of the things I'm going to talk about today is for with me there was a kind of a, well it was a big obstacle that uh, that was preventing that. And so um, yeah, I'm going to get to how I went full town, kind of what we do. But I'd like to cover a more important thing and how that get um, well for all of us how that affects our personal sanctifi- sanctification. Um, our holiness before God, how we're going to live our lives, what is it that's preventing the church from going, uh, and what, what was preventing me from going full-time. Um, and so that with that, that's kind of the direction we're heading, and I'm going to, if you would, we're going to, I'd like to pray one more time. Uh, Father, you are our great God. Uh, you are God who hears, not like the other false gods in the world that, um, that, that are made with men's imaginations, but God, you are the true God, the first and the last, and besides you, there is no God. And we are thankful uh, that you are a powerful God and a wise God. And like Pastor Chuck said, God, you know all things, and we look to you for knowledge, for wisdom, for guidance and direction in our lives. And God, we come to you now recognizing that we can do nothing apart from you. You are the vine, we are the branches, and God, I pray Um, That you would be glorified, your name would be high and lifted up now as we um, go to your word. Um, And we, I just pray that we would have soft hearts. If we meet and find in ourselves and our hearts uh, a sin and things need to be dealt with, that we would confess and we would print and we would trust in you and move forward. Not trusting in pragmatism, uh, but the sovereignty of God and that you know what is best and that we need your revelation. 
And God, we love you and we praise your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so, uh, it's, <laughs> the, the, the craziness of America has pretty much been talked about quite a bit already. So I don't know how much I need to, to go into that. You know, we've talked about, we have 3,000 plus babies, image bearers of God. You know, we've, uh, Mason has signs out there. I don't know how well you guys do, but it, it's a struggle with me even to see those things. Um, and it breaks my heart, and that's why I know a lot of you abolitionist heart, you know, we're out there, and we're on the front lines trying to confront that. So we have that wickedness, we have the transgenderism, we have uh, the gay homosexuality thing getting shoved in our face, just an affront to a picture of the marriage of, uh, really, Christ and his bride, right? And we have the response, the crazy response to COVID-19. We have idolatry, sports idolatry running rampant. So we have all these things, um, and then the riots, Right? I mean, it, it seems to be that, like in, it says in Ecclesiastes, um, the heart of the sons of men are full of evil, and insanity is in their hearts throughout their lives. You know, that's what I, it seems to be what we see. It, there is just widespread insanity. Um, you know, if, uh, if somebody wins the lottery and their, and their life tanks, right? A lot of times what we say is, man, that money changed their lives. You know, it really didn't. It didn't change their lives. It just really exposed what was already there. And I think what we're seeing right now in America is just exposing what is really in the heart of man. It's going back full circle to what, what happened in the garden, right? Man doesn't want to be under the authority of anybody. I have the decision in myself to decide where I want to go. And so you have autonomy versus theonomy, right? Personal law, self-law, govern, I'll govern myself. Or is it God going to be the one that governs my life? And so we see that. I am not going to submit. God, police need to go. Defund the police, right? And this, we, we're, we're wanting tyrants. We're wanting anarchy to take over. Instead of submitting to the true king, um, the king of kings and the lord of lords, which we know is the best for all. So we know that the best thing for everybody is the gospel, right? It's, it's the solution to this whole thing. We realize in this room, more than anybody else, I think, is that the gospel is the solution, but I would also say that I think there's a, a danger in what we've done to the gospel, and it seems as if, in some ways, we've, we've truncated it. And what I mean by that is we, it, we've made it to be something that all we think about is that we're going to go out, and, we're gonna, and, we, and we preach the gospel, and we sow the seed, right? Amen, like how Pastor Chuck says. But then we're just hoping for this guy to be saved over here, and then this guy to be saved over here. And that's all it becomes. And then it becomes just this thing of just individual salvation, saving this person from hell and just gathering up a lot of people so they can have, you know, have their get out of jail free card and get to heaven. But brothers and sisters, I would, I, I would you know, as, as Pastor Chuck was going through Psalm 2, I got to think about this more and more. The gospel is, you know, what was lost with the first Adam is being restored in the second, right? And so it's not just individuals he's after, it's the world. And, and everything in the world. So the economy, politics, art, music, all these things. Jesus is Lord and he has claim on these things. And so with that, we ought to be taking the gospel into absolutely every sphere of life. You know, we have a, a good historical example. A lot of us know of William Wilberforce. Right? And what, and what, is, what is he known for? William Wilberforce. Anybody? Ending the slave trade. Ending the slave trade. Uh, right. And so he had two great objects, right? So after the, the great change, when he gets saved, there's two great objects that he commits his life to. And that one was ending the slave trade. What's the, what's the other one? See, this one hardly isn't any. It's, it's not really known. It's called the Reformation of Manners. And it's not really a, like dressing up your pleas and thank yous and how, and how to set a dinner table. But re what Wilberforce understood was he looked across the landscape of London at the time. And it was in the same thing that we look at when we look in, in our society, right? Debauchery, horrible things going on. And he looked at that in, in, in London at the time, and they had things like, you know, child prostitution, poverty was rampant, drunkenness, bull baiting. I don't know if you know what bull baiting is, so they would stake a bull to the ground, they'd sick dogs on it and just tear that thing apart. And the politicians at the time, they, not, they actually looked at that and they said, you know what, we want to keep that going because then the, the really violent people, that's actually taming them. So they're not going to go out and commit violence acts on each other. They'll just, that'll be tamed down from watching this event, like, you know, a tamed down gladiator event. But what William Wilberforce recognized was that those were just symptoms. 
So in the same way, when we talk about the lottery, right, and somebody wins the lottery and it, and it puts on display um, what's really in their heart, it, it's the same thing. So all those things are just showing a condition of man's heart. And so the moral compass of London at the time was broke. And I think that's the same thing that we see in America right now, right? The moral compass is broken. Why? Well, we have sinful hearts. And so what do we do? What does a Christian do in 21st century America? In the book of Ecclesiastes um, 9, 9-10, uh, it says, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For there is no activity or planning or knowledge or wisdom in shield where you are going. So there's a finality to death, right? So what we do here is going to matter. There's that little word, uh, well, your daughter, right? Selah? Yeah. Beautiful name. We were talking about this on the way up. And, uh, and so a lot of people, you know, it's just the, the pause in the, in, in the music and we stop and meditate. Well, a lot of people argue it's like weighing. So we give priority weight. And so you, 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 you hear truths and then you give it weight. And you meditate on it, and like, what am I going to do with it? And there, we've gotten a lot of truth here, right? I mean, we have got some outstanding teaching um, from our brothers on the sovereignty of God, perception, reality, right? Go, therefore. And we've had all this amazing teaching, and then our brother Ryan is going to come up and talk about abolitionism. But, but, but at the end of the day, what are we going to do? You know, we live in a society that is built on, like, sound bites. You know, we don't sit, and we don't, we don't, we don't meditate all that. And I think that's, we have a hard time praying and keeping our minds focused on things is because it, it's sound bites. We, we get this expert and we get that expert and, and we're taking it all in and there's just noise, noise, noise and we're just moving from one thought to the, to the next. But the difficulty in connecting them. And so I'd say that through all this that we would, you know, when we leave, because you are in some ways, you know, we're drinking from the fire hose right here, right? It's hard to digest all that. But when we leave, I would just, you know, have you all consider it. Spend time alone and consider some of these things. What are we going to do when we leave? When we're, when we're all alone and, uh, and, and we feel those things, you know, and we, we know God is calling us to go out, but then there's, there's going to be these, these weights, these things pushing against us, wanting to hinder us from going and obeying our king. Because what we do now, I would say, and we know this, what we do or don't do for Jesus now, it determines our eternity. And we don't get second chances. So this is it. Jonathan Edwards, he says this, he says, I resolved... Or resolve to keep ever present in my mind the shortness of life, the certainty and suddenness of death, and the length of eternity. You know, I'm, I think of myself as an unbeliever when I was an unbeliever and how much time I would spend to like consider and prioritize, like what am I gonna, what am I going to do with my life? And uh, yeah, I mean, remember in high school, right? And you're trying to determine your career, like all the little tests you take and they determine what your talents are and your strengths and your weaknesses. Um, when we go on camping trips or outings, vacations, we spend a lot of time prioritizing all these things. But when, when it comes to our Christianity, like, like, are we doing the same thing? Are we taking the time to just pause? And what do we do with these truths that God has given us? What do we do with these things like that? That the sovereignty of God, do we really trust these things? Do they really change the way that we live? And, you know, there's a, there's, uh, there's a danger, and a lot of times we, we hear truths, but then we don't, we don't actually act like we believe them. Like the eyes of the Lord are in every place, looking over the good and the evil. Should that change the way that you live? Like, does that affect the way that you live? Or do you believe it? I mean, honestly, when you're alone, and then that temptation comes to sin... You know, there's a lot, there's, people talk about pornography in the Christian church. Do we believe that the eyes of the Lord are in every place? So do we believe these things? Have we actually stopped and give weight to these truths of God? And what I'd like to talk about a little bit, what's been a hindrance to me, and I think with the gospel going out, evangelism in our churches, is this idea, you know, we have a wrong perspective, uh, but it's pragmatism. Right? Um... If you go up to the book of Ecclesiastes again, I was spending a lot of time in here. And this, you know, I had a whole like sermon prepped on that, but I, I kind of got the take that um, it was more uh, Mason would like me to talk about going full time, but I, I couldn't help but want to interject some of these things. And so um, in Ecclesiastes 1, 12 through 14, he says, I set my mind to seek and to explore by wisdom concerning all that all that has been done under 
heaven. We find the same type of language in chapter 8, and it says, When I gave my heart to know wisdom, and to see the task which has been done on the earth, and then and he goes on the end of that, it says, Man cannot discover the work that's been done under the sun. And so you have this idea that's been, we got under the sun, under uh, heaven, on the earth, and it seemed kind of capturing the same meaning, okay? If we go to Ecclesiastes 5.2, and I'm just kind of running through these, you can go there if you would like, but just hear me here. I'm going to explain. In 5.2 it says, For God is in the heaven, and you are on the earth. So there's a lot of people they would, they would take, because in the book of Ecclesiastes, this word is used like 30 some times. So we need to understand what it means, right? And a lot of people would say, well, it's just the physical world. That's all it is. Um, but I think there's more to be, to be said. Because in, in, in chapter 5, verse 2, he says, In the heavens, God is in the heavens, you are on the earth. That on the earth has captured it's that same idea of being under the heavens, under the sun. Right? So there's this perspective. It's, it's as if God has drawn a line. God is in the heavens. It's not, I'm not arguing against his omnipresence. But God is in the heavens and we are on the earth. And so in the whole book of Ecclesiastes, what Solomon is, is attempting to do is to sort through, like, why do things happen the way they are? How can we live wise? But he's doing it only with the tools given to him under heaven. Right? So reason, observation, without the revelation of God. Yes, he's, he's, he's recognizing God, but he's not using God's revelation to determine these things. Right? Why do bad things happen to good people? Like, why is there all this injustice? Why are these things happening? Now, we can make sense of those as Christians if we know God's revelation, but if I don't have God's revelation, like, what do I do with that? Right? And so that's what, he, well, that's what he's attempting to do. And I think, I'm, I'm realizing, I think more than more, even in my own life, and the church, is that... If, if, we, if we leave God's revelation out and, we, and, we, and we're just operating with this under the sun approach to life, then what we're left with is my reasoning, my observations, my reflections on life are going to determine how I go about things. When I, so I'll start a little bit in my kind of pursuit to uh, full-time ministry. When I, I was with one of those guys a lot, many years ago when I first got saved, I go down to see my brother in Vegas and we're walking down the strip, and there's this guy in a box preaching. And I remember walking by, and I was a Christian, brand new Christian at the time. And I remember telling my brother, that's not how you do that. Right? <laughs> I don't think that's how you do that. And, and then, and then, but, but then God is gracious, right? And I, and I, and I start realizing, and he's patient. And he starts chipping away at these little things. But, but, but why did I come to that conclusion? I mean, why do people oppose the street preaching? Why do they oppose the, the holding up of our signs? Well, if you just took it from an under-the-sun approach, right? So we're not going to take God's revelation. We're just going to take what I observe, what I reason in my own mind. Okay? The guy gets up on the box or up on the pillar or wherever he does, and he starts preaching. Well, what, what do we observe? Well, people look at that, and they're indifferent. They walk by. Maybe they hate him. They're mad at him. They're upset. You're doing it, you're doing it wrong, right, John? You have all these things, but it's animosity. And, uh, and then even those who claim to be Christians, right, who are supposed to be our brothers, them themselves tell us that we're doing it wrong. So, so what are we left with? If we're just left with that, well, then we're doing it wrong, right? If it's just this pragmatic approach, it's just this under-the-sun approach to life, it's, it's not going to lead us in a, in a right direction. And the same thing, I used to go down to, to Manti in the southern Utah, and we'd go you know, share the gospel with the Mormons. And I, and I remember going down there, and there's, it's that same approach, you know, it's more of an apologetic. You got to say this and this and this. You got to destroy. You got to show where uh, the Mormon has all these false beliefs. But you know, I talked to a brother once. And he says, "Yeah, I convinced, I convinced my uh, Mormon friend, and he had him come over to his house numerous times over over months. And he says I convinced him that Mormonism was wrong, and I convinced him right into atheism." Because what? Because what was he doing? He wasn't standing on God's word. He was reasoning. He was using his own his own mind. And so, you know, I really appreciate men that would stand up here and they and they and they speak on the sovereignty of God. They speak on the truths of hell, and they speak on the the need to just preach God's word because the power is in the gospel. The power is not in our eloquence of speech. It's not in our wisdom, right? It's not in my apologetic. Apologetics does not save anybody. Let's use the apologetics to shut the mouth that we can get to the more important thing like the gospel, right? 
And so really one of the things that really shifted this for me, and it's where I met Mason, uh, I, I met a brother down at the end abortion conference and from just a, just a random weird connection, I ended up getting in touch with this guy named Bill Adams. And uh, so I go down and I don't know, know a whole lot about street preaching or nothing, but he's talking about, you know, evangelism. You have to give people evangelism. And I was like, I don't know, I mean, that's always on my heart. I can't not speak about the gospel. But the idea of the evangelist, like just being the one that stands and proclaims, you know, we just don't see it. And so I go down there and I saw, I meet mean, these guys, Mason, and he's just like, I mean, you know, Mason, he's just like gifted, right? He's just, he can just stand and just speak. Like, that's not me. I'm terrified. Like, I'm serious here. I am actually, I have a horrifying fear of public speaking. I was the guy in college that it would go around the room, and all you have to do is stand up and say your name, right? Say your name, where you're from. And I am freaking out. Like, my hands are sweating, my heart's going, and all I want to do is run to the bathroom. Like, that's me. And so, and I remember being in the military. You know, I was chasing, I was like, the, you know, going to uh, airborne school and ranger school, and uh, you're overseas, and you're taking, and I'm chasing all this stuff, and I'm in the, you know, special forces pipeline, chasing the, the, the pride of life, you know? And it's just, and I'm going that direction, and uh, and realizing in it, excuse me, getting me um, I want to see where it's going there for a minute. Um, so going that direction, and this is what it is. I start talking about the fear of public speaking, and I you know, that's where it goes. And but I was afraid. You know, my mom got sick at the time. And I think I used that as a reason to get out. But at the end of the day, I think it was really just like a fear of being exposed to having like, people know. Like, I'm, I'm afraid it's going to be the downfall. I remember being angry. I wasn't a Christian at the time. I was angry with God. Because if you would just get me over this, then I could really do big things. <laughs> right? For myself. And that was the ironic part is that now what he's called me to do is to go preach the gospel. And so the only time I feel like I can get up and actually speak in front of people it's, well, it's because of him. Um, and so, you know, because I can put the spotlight on him. That's why this part's hard, because I feel like you know, if I could just preach, we could talk about him, but we'll talk about this road to full-time ministry, and now I'm not doing so well. So, um, but a pragmatic approach, right? And so going down to there with Mason and these guys down to L.A., and I see what it looks like, and it's just a standing and preaching. And so we do that for a couple of days, and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll still never forget this, and I'm, so we're... The next morning, early in the morning, I fly out, and I'm sitting there in the hotel room with Bill Adams, and he goes, you know, a lot of guys, they, they talk about, you know, I had this really great one-hour conversation with this guy or that guy, and he goes, I just wonder, is it just like a semi-Pelagian approach, as if they just need more information? You know, and that's what we do a lot of times, too, right? I mean, we're, we're talking with people, and the flight was, if I could just get over this obstacle, and then this one, and then, and then it becomes something. They just need more information. And what does that come from? Well, it's, it's an under-the-sun approach. It's a pragmatic approach. I'm using my reasoning and my observations to determine how I am to go about following Christ. But that is not how he's called us to do, right? He's called us to go and just preach the gospel. And let the gospel be the power of God to salvation that me and would see the beauty of Christ, Amen. right? And come to him in faith. And so what I realized... I come to realize that pragmatism, right? But then I also re realize as I'm on the street now, and now I go on the street and I'm preaching, and then Christians are coming against me, and I'm finding that, you know, it's your pragmatism, this under-the-sun approach, that, that's, a, that's the problem. What you need is that in heaven, you need revelation from God, you need to do things His way, but then that's the very thing that is preventing me from just being obedient to God. Because then what am I saying all the time? Why, did, why wasn't I just going to the street and following him, and just because I had a burden, right? Babies are being murdered. And in the small town America, you know, there is, there's not really evangelists there. People go overseas or into the big cities. So that leaves a vacuum. And so my, that, it's like killing me. And I'm like, well, what do we, what do we do about this? But the thing preventing me from doing it was pragmatism. Because I was looking out and my own observations saying, well, how am I going to provide for my family? Right? How am I going to do that? Well, God said, what did, what did Jesus say? He says, go seek my kingdom, right? Seek my righteousness, my, and all these other things will be added to you. So it goes back to that. Did I actually believe it? Did I believe it? In the same way, when we look at that, people say, um, yeah, I believe that the eyes of the Lord are in every place. 
then they go and like look at pornography or do things they ought not do. So it's the same thing. Are we really believing? And so, you know, it wasn't some great step that led me to this place where I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to be faithful and follow Christ the best that I can. The broken man that I am, uh, insufficient in so many ways. But it's just like a continued confession and repentance and confession and repentance over and over and over. And a, and a constant dying to myself. And what I, I think I love the most about my job now is I get to preach a message that I need to hear every day more and more and more. And so I needed to really, I needed to take the log out of my own eye, right, instead of just looking at everybody else's. And so, I, you know, with a lot of this stuff, guys, with the truth, if you're, if you're hearing these things, and if anything is pressing on you, you know, if there's pragmatism in your life, if there are these verses, you say, oh, yeah, I agree with that, but it's not affecting how you live. You know, it's confession, right? And confession is, is, is literally say the same thing, right? Ben and I were just talking about this, to literally say the same thing. I need to agree with God. I need to look at my sin and see it how God sees it, not how I want to see it, not how my reasoning determines it to be. Oh, that's not really that big a thing, right? It put Christ on the cross, bloodied our king. It's not a small thing. Sin is not a small thing. There is no small sin. And we need to get serious about it and, 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 and look in our, and stop, right? Say law. Say law. It's like, can you say law with your mouth shut? So <laughs> shut your mouth and say law, right? So stop, meditate, weigh the words of God and let them affect uh, your life. And so I did. And so I started praying, right? Okay, God, you say you know what, you're going to do these things, but you need, to make a, you need to do a work now in my wife's life. Because there's no way that she's on board with this. And so I started praying. I was seeking God. God, you say this. And I was arguing with him. And then I'm coming home from church one day, and my wife says, what do you think about moving to Hermiston? And I almost ran off the road, because we were driving like an hour to church, you know, at the time. And, uh, and I did. I almost just ran completely off the road. And because she, we had this nice little house, and I'm making six figures as a, as a lineman, and uh, homeschool and my wife. We have a nice place overlooks a lake and all this acreage. And she says, what, "What do you think about moving to Hermiston?" When we're driving there for homeschool co-ops and all this other stuff. I'm like, yeah. And she goes, "You think you could get a job at the power company there?" I was like, "I don't know." And so I'm praying through that, and I go to her. I'm like, "My heart is not for that. What do you think if we go and I just go full time, like in the mission?" She's like, well, "How's that going to work?" It's like, "I don't know." <laughs> Jesus said, "Go." That's, I, that's what I know. And so she's like, "Well." So I talk to my pastor, and, and we start working through these things. And he says, well, why don't we set a course? You know, and so we do. We don't want to be wise. You know, we're not we're foolish with things. And so we're trying to be wise with us financially. And we were, we were there financially to be able to do it. We had gotten rid of debt in the past. And so here's just a side note. If you have debt, friends, get yourselves out of it. So if God puts you in a place where he's calling you somewhere, don't let that be the thing holding you down. But anyway, so be wise with our finances. We're trying to plan this stuff out. Well, so my wife and I say, okay, we're going to do it. That week, that week at work, my back goes out again. I've been struggling with it from time in the military. And so I go to the doctor, and the doctor says, yeah, you can't do your job anymore. Okay? So I go home and tell my wife, like, I, I can't do my job. So I, I'm, now I'm out of a job, right? So I make the decision to go full time, and then God takes my job away. So I'm like, okay, well, I guess it's not later. I guess it's now. And I don't want to go through, like, all the events because it is crazy. I mean, I, it goes from first person we talk to who, you know, it's our horseshoer. My wife's like, ooh, we're going to ask. And somebody said, maybe your horseshoer. And I was like, well, well, try to get a hold of him. Well, it's impossible. He, he's always so far out. She texts him. He's like, he said he'll be here tomorrow. So he shows up tomorrow. My wife asks him, you interested in a home? Yeah, they call us that night. Yeah, we'll buy your house. Okay. <laughs> And so our house gets sold, and then we're living in a brother's camper. And things are just, like, flying. Like, God is just, like, and I was like, okay, well, how, how are we going to pay for anything? And then that, like, my wife's work says, hey, you looking to go full-time? Can you go full-time? So she's like, yeah. So that starts as soon as my last paycheck is done. And so she's a nurse, so she's just three days a week. For, and we're, you know, trying to work all this stuff out. And so, uh, but a, a myriad of events. We get a home in Hermiston. Um, and then the VA uh, ups my uh, disability because of the back, and that takes care of now our mortgage and all of our utilities. And so that's covered now. Um, and, and in other ways, our church now supports us. And there's just like all this stuff, and God just starts like providing. 
And why? Well, because he says, seek my kingdom and I'll provide. Right? But what did it take? It took a little baby step. It took a little baby step of faith to say, okay, he says it. I'm just going to try to believe it. I can't reason this way because it doesn't look like it's going to work. And everything I'm observing, it doesn't look like this should actually work. I'm just going to trust. And God, please come through. You say you will. And I tell you, it will drive you to prayer. It will drive you to prayer. But he is a faithful God and he will meet you. And so now, like what our ministry is, I'm not going to. What it is now is it's a small town. It's called In Andrew Steps Ministries, and the reason why is because Andrew is he's my favorite, uh, I think, apostle. Because you know, all you find him doing was, like, leading people to Jesus. Like, nobody really remembers him. He's just leading people to Jesus all the time. Yeah, he brought them to Jesus. You know, there's some Greeks that show up, right, to worship uh, God, and they want to see Jesus. And so um, they come to Philip. Philip's like, I don't know, what do we do with Greeks, right? If this is the Messiah, that's for the Jews. And so what does he do? To Andrew. And Andrew's like, well, I know, so you don't have to take him to Jesus, right? Mm-hmm. And so he, he recognizes, like, it's, 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 it's those people that everybody else is going to maybe look past and despise parts of the world, you know, the Greeks, the dogs. Um, and so I see that in some ways with, like, where I grew up, small town America, right? So the forgotten, forgotten place. We don't, we don't really labor there a lot. And so that's where my heart is. And so that's what we do. And we, so it's door to door. Uh, we go preach at the Walmart or we go where we go find people and we preach there and we go find people on the streets um, every day where Hermiston is really strategically located. You know, a half hour away, we have a Planned Parenthood. And a half hour away, we have two colleges. A half hour away, we have two, uh, uh, what do we got? Prisons, schools, and the Planned Parenthood. And so, you know, we've, we got every Monday, we go to Planned Parenthood. Uh, Tuesdays, we go to the community college and labor there. We go to the prison, just got established. Uh, we go argue at the Kennewick City Council that they would make Kennewick a sanctuary city and stop murdering their children. Um, and so we, we got all this stuff, and it's kind of getting established. And then COVID-19 hits, right? And it just goes away. Like, and now it's like, now what? And I would say that the temptation is now, and this is where I think we're struggling as a church, is, okay, what is our observation, right? What do all the experts say? How do we reason our way through this? Well, friends, that doesn't work, right? Pragmatism does not work. An under-the-sun approach does not work. We need God's ways in heaven, God's revelation. And so I'm just going to run through this real quick. Here, I spent some time, because I was tired of the noise, right? I mean, the noise was... uh, well, it was frustrating. We were having a Bible study the other morning. We were going through 1 John. And you know what? 1 John, the context, right? It was kind of some Gnosticism, pre-Gnosticism, right? Coming to all these people talking about knowledge this and knowledge that. And John comes and he says, I write these things that you might know. Wouldn't that be nice? Amidst all the noise, somebody comes in and says, I write these things that you might know. And that's what God has done. That's what God has done with his, with his word. And I, so I, you know, I, where do, what can, is there some place I can start in the Bible and start working through reasoning, as Pastor Chuck talked, right? Not reasoning with my own mind, but reasoning from the scriptures. Is there a place we can start and then build a place where we can actually take action on what we do? Well, Psalm 103, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens, in the heavens. So there's a good starting place, not under the sun where we like to live. And he, he is, his sovereignty rules over all things. Praise God. Isaiah 45, it says, I am the Lord, causing well-being and creating calamity. Right? I am the Lord who does these things. Calamity, too. Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Is, currently, not just this present thing, but God's wrath abides, right, on people. Okay, so is that, can we look at then COVID-19 and say, well, yeah, this whole thing. And COVID-19, I know, I'm with you. I think it's not buying the pestilence part. But, you know, the response to it, the whole thing, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a nightmare right now. And God is in control. And can we say it is God's wrath? Yeah, every single thing in this broken world, if it's bad, if it brings sin and stuff, like suffering and death and all those things, yeah, it's a response. God's response to that is his wrath, Right? And why? Well, Romans 5, 12. Through one man, sin entered into the world, and death through sin. And death spread to all men because all sin. So the principal cause of pestilence, or this response to it, it's not the corruption of air, 
It's the sin against God. Right? At the end of the day. Matthew 15, Jesus says, It's not what goes into a man's mouth that defiles him, but what comes out of him. It's the heart of man. It's like we talked about. Everything that's going on is, getting, is, is happening because of the wickedness of man's heart. Right? We're just seeing it more fully because oh, we live in America. And so, what does the Bible say about that sin? The wages of sin is death. So if sin is the cause, the solution is what? What's what we started with? The gospel. So the proper response to COVID-19, to the riots, to all this stuff, is the gospel. Right? That's the whole thing of what Ecclesiastes even talks about. The whole book. When Solomon's going through all these things, why, did things all, why does all this happen? And what he continues to conclude with is, fear God, obey Fear God. Trust God. I don't know. So it's got to be. God's got to invade. He's the one that's in heavens and on. Jesus says, I have authority in both what? Heaven and earth. So he's the one coming from heaven that actually can invade earth and actually speak to our situation, which I think he has. And like Pastor Chuck said too, right? In 1 Peter 4, 17. For it is time for judgment to begin with the house of God. And why? What, is there not apathy? Do we not really have, like, indifference and idolatry? I was reading in, in Revelation 3 to the, the church of Sardis where it says, I know your deeds, that you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Right? Think about, this made me think, if you have two people, this is why we need revival in the church. That's where we have to actually go down to our knees, pray for revival and awakening. But revival, can. that's why it's hard. You know, we look out across, why is there so few here? I mean, and this is a lot, right? This is a lot for an evangelism conference, and we're in Southern Oregon. This is a lot of people. But you, you go to where I am, we might have three. And why is that? What do we need? We need revival. We need men's hearts stirred up. And how does that happen? Well, God's word. But if you look, like, if there was two bodies floated, flipped upside down, right? Face down out in the water. And somebody went out and rescued them. They bring them on shore. And they got two people. They're doing CPR. And, they, and, and, they, and one wakes up. Okay, and he comes back to life. And then they find out that the other one, man, he's been dead for like three hours. But could you have told which one was alive and which one was dead before they started the CPR? Could you? And that's what I think. And like, it's hard. We look out across. I don't know who was dead and who was alive. Like, we need to wake up, right? As a church, we need to wake up and actually believe God's word. Confess, repent. Confess, repent. It needs to be a daily Minute by minute, day by day, walk with God, die to myself, live for Him. And so we have this. So there's, there, uh, you take all that, and then we have promises, because then there's fear, right? That fear that always comes. But what is, there's promises that we have as Christians. And so I look to some of these promises. Romans 8 28, God causes all things to work together for good. Right? We, 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 we know that, that's always there. Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, a present help in trouble, present help, a present help in trouble. Psalm 34, 9 through 10, for those who fear him, there is no want. They who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. These are some of them that help me to get past my pragmatism. Like, do we actually trust these things? Do we actually believe them? Philippians 4, same thing. And my God will supply all your needs, all of them. According to his riches in the glory of Christ Jesus. Proverbs 10.3, the Lord will not allow the righteous to hunger. Psalm 91, even in that time, maybe when we were thinking, man, this whole COVID-19 thing, that, it might be a dangerous thing. What does God's word say? For it is he who delivers you from the deadly pestilence. You will not be afraid of the terror by night or the arrow that flies by day, of the pestilence that stalks in the darkness or the destruction that lays waste at noon. Thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. And so how can we not go seek his kingdom, right? And how does his kingdom come? Like we've talked, like that's the whole thing of what Pastor Chuck was talking about. Preaching the gospel. That's what Wilberforce did. He brought the gospel in conflict with all the craziness. And with all that craziness, and then it got rid. You know, that is that that was the thing. He brought it into society. Every sphere. That's why we take the abortion signs out in the middle of public. Why? Because it's not an abortion mill problem. It's a society problem. Amen. And so we take the gospel to everywhere. We knock on doors. We go to the grocery store. Everywhere we go, we take the gospel because we need to change the moral compass of society. 
If you want abortion gone, that's how it's going to happen from preaching the gospel and changing of men's hearts. And so that's our hope. Does Christ's life, death, burial, resurrection, does it not change absolutely everything? And I would argue it does. But we've got to stop seeing the gospel as just this little save this guy over here, save this guy over here. No, he's king, authority on all, a heaven and earth. And so the, the, the command is to go out everywhere and to preach the gospel that men would be saved. And so I'll get some just closing thoughts. I said I'd try to be way faster uh, than the <laughs> pastor said. Uh, so, yeah, that's not hard. Um, so, so Selah, right? Way these things. So that we've heard, I would just uh, implore all of us, plead with you, uh, spend time alone with God on your knees. You know, it's not always like the Catholics where you go around and jump and pray on the pray on the street corners. No, that, that we go in, shut the door, and actually pray. And pray and seek God that He would raise up laborers. Seek God that He would end abortion. Seek God that His name would be high and lifted up. And we would pray and consider these things. And so we want to be wise, right? The book of Ecclesiastes, we want to be wise. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to please God. We're trying to honor him in the way that we live. Well, how do we be wise? Are we going to take the purely under the sun approach? Or are we going to actually trust God in what he has said? Let's go. And I'm going to end with this. We go to Psalm 107. The very end of Psalm 107. In verse 43, it says this. It says, who is wise? And it says, let him give heed to these things. And consider the loving kindness of the Lord. Well, what things? Well, the 42 verses prior. And what's interesting, you start in verse 4, and it, says, and it talks about these people, right? They wandered in the world wilderness. And they did not find a way in the habited city. They were hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted within them. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. So they're in this horrible situation. They're lost. They have nowhere to turn. And then they cried out to God. We go to verse 10. There were those who dwelt in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in misery and chains, because they rebelled against the words of the Lord, spurned the counsel of the Most High. So he humbled them with their heart, with labor, they stumbled and there was none to help, so they put themselves in a position where there was nowhere else to look but up, and then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them. Verse 17, fools, because of their rebellious way. We have a lot of this, right? We can look across America. It's fools because of their rebe rebellious ways. Because of their iniquities, were afflicted, their soul abhorred all kinds of food. You've been there, you know, you've done wrong things, you can't even eat. Right? They drew near to the gates of death. And it says, but it wasn't until then, right? Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And what did God do in his loving kindness? And he saved them in their trouble. In verse 23, it says, those who go down to the sea, go down to the sea in ships. Verse 25, he spoke and raised up a stormy wind which lifted up the waves of the sea. So their soul melted away and in their misery they reeled and staggered like drunken men. They were at their wits end. And then they cried out to the Lord. Look, I, friends, I don't know if you're not like looking around the, like, the scene of America right now, but it looks like people have their wits end a little bit. And I'm not saying that God's word only has its effect when men are in a, in a certain position, but we can look to God's word, right? And God's word says he puts people in a certain position, and we can say God's wrath is bringing this. His wrath is being revealed. He is causing all of this. And for what end? Could it be that this is an answer to our prayers? We, we pray that God would put people in a position that they would be receptive to the, to the gospel. So could it be that maybe this is? They're, they're at their wit's end. I don't want this. And people are rioting on the streets. They're looking. There's noise everywhere. They're looking for someone to say, to come in and say, you know what? I know there's all this craziness, but I write these things. I say these things that you might know. Right? And we point to this one who knows all things. It's not us. It's not our reasoning. It's not our observations. But it's Christ, the one who has all authority heaven and, and earth. And so it's him, and we look to him who invaded, who invaded under the sun, him who was in heaven and came under the sun and did what we could never do to give hope to mankind. And so that's our hope. Um, and you know what? If, and I'll end with this. There's a lot of talk about gathering, right? 
Why am I so concerned about the whole gathering? She gather here, gather here. Well, uh, Psalm 107, same psalm. Here, here, here's a beautiful thing. Here, let, let's get let's get our priority. Let's weigh things and say what is what is God in the business of doing, and let's go do that. And so it says, let's just start in verse one. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for He is good, for His loving kindness is everlasting. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the adversary and gathered from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. So God is gathering. God is gathering. So if we're concerned about gathering, you can gather. I know I'm probably equivocating on the word, but go gather, right? Like the exact thing that Chuck, Pastor Chuck is talking about. Go gather. Trust in the sovereignty of God. Trust in that his word actually has power. Go everywhere, preach the gospel, and know that his word will go out, never returning void, always accomplishing what his will, and to his glory and his glory alone. And so let's go forward, let's gather. Um, so I, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, so yeah, it's just, you know, one of the things, it is for me, uh, just personally, the thing, the big hindrance has been very, a very pragmatic approach, and at the end of the day, it's confession and repentance. You know, Pastor Chuck talked about the gospel. It's really simple. You know, it's the same thing with sanctification. It's just that we don't like it. Like, it's, that's, that's what's hard, right? Right? That's what tear out your eye and throw it from you. That's not, it, it's, it's not, it's not hard to understand, but it's, it's hard to do it's because it hurts. And so let's just be faithful and we, we care about him and we want to be useful tools in our master's hand. Um, holy vessels, uh, glorifying him and being an encouragement to each other. And so I'll leave with that. So again, um, thank you all. It has been a blessing, but I do probably got to run. But love you all, and uh, God bless. Eric, thank you for the reminder about peace. In the midst of the storm, that's kind of what I, I, I hear that wrapped around what you were exhorting us to. Peace in the Lord and what we know, trusting in Him. So, 450, 505, we'll be up and running, ready to go, okay? Um, final session, final teaching session, then we'll do food, fellowship. Q&A over there in the fellowship hall. Right. Blessings.